Vážení milovníci klasické hudby, mám velkou radost, že vás mohu přivítat z Pražského Rudolfina u zahajovacího koncertu osmého ročníku klavírního festivalu Rudolfa Firkušného. Je mou velkou ctí a příjemnou povinností vám představit skvělého švýcarského klavíristu Francesca Piemonteziho, který bude protagonistou dnešního večera. Nice to be here. I was speaking about uh, the pandemic situation, not, not only here in Prague, but in the whole Europe, uh, which has also influenced your artistic uh, season. Uh, you made your, uh, your debut concert with the Berlin Philharmonic and La Havšany, uh, but uh, the next, uh, next great debut of yourself with the New York Philharmonic and Jan Andrea Noseda has been cancelled. Uh, so my first question is very clear. Uh, how do you deal with the current situation? Well, first of all, I, I must say that I was in general pretty lucky because from June until now I've actually played almost without break. So actually the New York date is the only one which really went away. It's very sad, but the orchestra has already said that we will find a new date in the next season or in two seasons with exactly the same program, which is which is very nice. But of course it was a very uh, unexpected and difficult situation also for the nerves because we wouldn't know what the next week would bring to us. And I think now, more than ever, we don't know what the next weeks will bring. So I fear that this winter we will have to wait a little bit until we perform again. And therefore I'm incredibly grateful that we can actually be here in this wonderful place, which I think it's for piano solo the best acoustics in, in the world, um, and have this wonderful live broadcast for people who want to listen to music. So um, it has been difficult, but there were many situations like this one or other concerts where solutions were found, you know, streaming or radio broadcast. At least there is a will to go on and there is a will from the public. I witnessed this many, many times to listen to music and to be there and they are waiting for the next concerts to happen. And this makes me very, very happy. Yeah, thank you. Uh, reading your biography, uh, I have uh, to mention your teachers, very famous names uh, like uh, Ari Vardi, uh, Alfred Brendel, uh, Mari Peraya, Cecil Usse, uh, or Alexis Weissenberg. Uh, I bet there is something special that uh, each one of them gave you. Oh, sure. Um, I would start with Weissenberg. Uh, chronologically also and he was kind of a very lucky situation for us because you know I come from the Italian speaking part of Switzerland Lugano and actually Weissenberg was living there so um, he was living quite not next but near the house of my parents and so through some common friends he heard of me and he invited me for some lessons and some master classes I would say um, with him it was mostly this philosophical dimension he gave to everything. You know, he was an incredibly cultivated man. He studied philosophy at Sorbonne in, in Paris, you know. Uh, he had a doctor degree, I think, even. So he was somebody with a lot of imagination, a lot of culture. And I think this, um, you know, I was 14, 15 at the time. So, of course, if you meet somebody like this, this broadens you, you, your views in an in incomparable way. Um, Cecile Lusset was the person, actually, who taught me how to play the piano because I was, when I was a kid, you know, I, th I thought that I had a lot of things to say, but I didn't know how to say them. I was very, very um, tense at the piano and there were things I couldn't do. Um, and she came around the same time to play a recital in, in Switzerland and I heard it and I was completely amazed by the way she could actually have a kind of 100% between the mind, what she wanted and the realization. So I went to her uh, and I said, you, look, I, I, I need help. Uh, I, I would like to learn from you. And, and she looked at me a little bit, you know, not, not after every concert, a 13 or 14 years old boy goes and asks those questions. But, but she took on the challenge and asked me to send a recording, which I did. And then I w spent many, many weeks and months with her um, re 
uh, refurbishing, re resetting all all my my technique, and, and and this was very very important. So I learned again on how to play the piano. And um, Alfred Brendel was very unexpected. I received actually a letter from him because he heard a broadcast which was done at the BBC, and he wrote me the day after saying uh, I would like to work with you. Wow, so he chose you. Well, apparently, yes. So this, was, <laughs> this was very nice. You should write it, write it down to your biography. Yes. <laughs> and for him, um, all these details, you know, how a certain note is struck, the touch and the sense of timing, um, all of these details were incredibly important. So for him, I would say it was a kind of school of the ear. I really learned to listen so carefully to what I was doing. And Murray Pereira, I got to know him in Hanover, where I was studying with Ari Vardy, mm -hmm. who was also a major influence in, in my life and somebody who somehow managed to bring so many of these influences together. And um, so Pereira was somebody then who came to, to, to teach a masterclass and we got along very well from the first moment. And I often visited him in London. And with him it was more a question of music analysis, how to read a piece. Um, it was less uh, a lesson on piano playing. But you can see, um, with so many different personalities and so many great artists, I, I had the possibility to steal from right and left and here and there. In the end, uh, I had to put it all inside of me because, you know, in, in the end, this Miss Mivo goes on stage, it's not them. But I was very grateful that I could work with these people. Of course. Uh, Francesco, could you tell us uh, how do you approach a brand new piece? It's difficult to say. First, I must say that probably um, I, for some reasons, I don't know, I wake up in the morning, I have a piece in mind and this piece stays with me for days and this is the moment where I, f I find that I should play it, you know, it's an um, emotional decision. So this is the first thing, the piece has to speak to me in a certain way, otherwise I, don't, I cannot spend the time. And then what I do normally is I go to the piano, I play it from the beginning to the end, from the beginning to the end and so on. Um, not caring so much about details, but caring about uh, how the piece holds together, you know. I, I try to get a certain feeling uh, of a piece as if it were a sculpture, you know. What is the shape, where is the climax, where is the point of uh, less energy, With what is the point of high energy, and so on. And then I start working, I think, on, 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 on details. I, I, I like to work in, in, in different... Um, in different domains, so to s for instance, sometimes I work only on the sound mm -hmm. and I leave everything else away. Sometimes I work only on the emotions and I leave everything away. And all these layers, after a certain time, they come together. So it's, it's for me, making music or performing music, it's, it's, a, it's a sum of different layers. And I'm working separately on them until my brain somehow and my body puts them together. That's great. Uh, do you have a favorite time of the day for practicing? Well, uh, normally it would be after 8 p.m., but, you know, uh, uh, because I'm not a morning person at all, but I force myself to, to, be, to be practicing in the morning because I want to do other things, you know, in the, in the evening and when the pandemic will be over, uh, to go out and uh, listen to opera and to, to cinema and, 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 and meeting friends and so on. So, so in the end, I, I, get, I, I finish practicing maybe by 4 p.m. Uh, you are known all over the world uh, as a great performer, especially of the classical and uh, romantic repertoire. But I know that uh, you are deeply interested uh, in the contemporary music as well. Uh, after all, we can find uh, if we can find it uh, tonight in your repertoire, uh, because uh, you will play uh, you will play uh, five variations on the theme by Schubert by a contemporary German uh, German composer Helmut Lachenmann in his own right. Uh, in your opinion, uh, why is the contemporary music worth listening, even for the more conservative listeners? And uh, what kind of mindset should they listen to, uh, should they, uh, listen to, to with? Well, I would say um, 
that music is something which is alive and has been alive for many centuries. And it's a pity that we make distinctions like the classical, romantic and baroque. And it's just for our mind, but in the end, everything, it's a very logical line which unfolds in time. And uh, with a lot of revolutions and a lot of changing, a lot of ideas coming from so many cultures. And here are where we are at the moment. And I think the main fear um, of, of, of some listeners is that they would probably have to sit for 20, 30 minutes and listen to something which they might not know. And this is the difference of going to an art museum and seeing contemporary modern art, because there you can choose. You can spend two seconds on something you don't like and 30 minutes on something that you like. But here, actually, you are forced to, to spend time. And I would say I would be completely open to anything, because uh, from everything we can learn, from everything we can be inspired, and you know what was so interesting was in, 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 in Ascona in Switzerland where I'm also promoting my own festival, we had some concerts with kids from schools and, and people who didn't know music or didn't study music. And um, I played some contemporary repertoire and this was by far the things which interested them the most, you know. So, and, and this frame of mind, you know, to be open, to be enjoying something that I've not, I've never heard and I don't know what will be happening. I think it's, it's something very, very important and something very inspiring. So I would say to anyone, go to a concert, don't expect anything, let it just happen. And then at the end, if you don't like, okay, but not with prejudices before it starts. Yes, I have the same opinion. That's great. Uh, last question, Francesco. Uh, uh, this this question will be will be the same for uh, every pianist here in in uh, Ferkushni Piano Festival. Uh, what is, in your opinion, the closest synonym for talent? That's a difficult question. Um, I think everybody has a talent somewhere. I remember people at high school studying with me, you know, normal school, not music school, and they, they were making incredible pictures on, on the paper. I, I really thought this is great art, but then they went into something else. So I think everyone has a talent somewhere. Um, unfortunately, society somehow forces you in one direction and, and the other direction. So I was very lucky that my talent was somehow helped by, by the music and I could I could choose my life to go in this way. Um, and this said, if this is happening, then I would say talent is probably many things. It's the ability to, first of all, physically to be able to play a certain instrument. It's the talent of listening, listening really carefully. It's the talent to connect with your body and, and, and putting body and mind and spirit and music all together. But then I would say the greatest talent is endurance and the greatest talent is work. You know, it's, it's, it, doesn't, it doesn't work without. You can have the greatest talents in, in history and if you're not sitting there and if you're not trying every day to, to, to listen to yourself even better than you did yesterday and, and to, to enter the music even more than you did one week ago, then it doesn't go on. So I think the greatest talent is actually the capacity of work. <laughs>